Now we're going to talk about the cochlear amplifier. And where we left off is uh, we have two sets of ha hair cells in the cochlear duct. Remember, this is the cochlear duct. Here are the outer hair cells. Here's the inner hair cells. And even though there are roughly three times as many outer hair cells than inner hair cells, it's only the inner hair cells that send information into the central nervous system. So what's that? What's up with all these outer hair cells? What are they doing? Well, this is one of the most exciting um, developments in, in neuroscience. So let's go to the board for a second. And what we see is a diagram of, an, uh, of a hair cell. And this is true. This is a diagram of either outer or inner hair cell. It has a cell body and it has stereocilia. And the stereocilia are joined by these uh, protonaceous tip links. So there's a tip link that joins a taller stereocilia to the next stereocilia. And the tip link ends on the MET channel. So if we blow just this little part up, what we see is right here. Here's the stereocilia, here's the MET channel, and the tip link is physically attached to the MET channel. So that when this stretches, when the, when the bundle, this is the bundle, when the bundle is moved, this uh, door opens. And now the, the MET channel, it, uh, ions can, can flow through the MET channel. So remember, furthermore, that there's an endocochlear potential of roughly plus 80 millivolts. <clears throat> This is a potential that's made by the battery that is the stria vascularis. And that is, um, uh, so, so the driving force across this MET channel goes from plus 80 millivolts on the outside, in the endolymph side, to my, roughly minus 50 millivolts or so on the internal side. So uh, hair cells, as with photoreceptors, have an elevated resting um, membrane potential. They're not at negative 70. They could even be at negative 45. So they're elevated. In any case, the driving force here is more than 100 millivolts. It's 130 millivolts or so. Um, and that is in stark contrast to the typical driving force, which is, which is around 70. So just over half of what, it, uh, of what this driving force is. So that means that once this, this lid comes off and the channel is open, uh, potassium, remember that this endolymph is weird because it has high levels of potassium. Potassium, sodium, and calcium, as it turns out, are all going to flow through this cation channel. And the result is going to be a very quick, very, very quick, Sound is quick. When we're, when we're talking about hearing up to 20 kilohertz, the stimulus is very quick. So um, this is a very quick response. Just remember how slow vision is. Vision is, is supported by a metabotropic receptor, rhodopsin, and this is, is the polar opposite of that. This is an ionotropic receptor with a huge driving force, so the response is very, very fast. Great. So now what does the outer hair cell do with that response? Let's go back to the slides for a moment. So here are the outer hair cells. This is a colorized photomicrograph, scanning electron micrograph of the uh, cochlea. And here's the inner hair cells. Here are the three rows of outer hair cells. And what you see is that the outer hair cells don't respond, but they're going to amplify the signal for the inner hair cells. How are they going to do that? They're going to do it using a molecule called Preston. And what Preston is, is, a, is a, essentially a molecular motor. It is a molecule that is going to change its conformation uh, in response to voltage. But it's going to change its conformation so much that it either shortens or lengthens the length of the cell. So as, the, as, um, as sound comes in here, there are waves of pressure. And these bundles are going to go back and forth as the pressure is being uh, put 
as there's compression and rarefaction at the oval window, there will be uh, these. This bundle will go back and forth, and this these Preston molecules will lengthen and shorten. And as a result, this is going to move. So I actually want you not to believe me so much so that you're driven to go look at a dancing hair cell. Now this is one of, my, of a few sites where you can see a dancing hair cell. In this, time, in this case, it's dancing to rock and roll. And, and you'll see it moving uh, in, in time with the beat. And it's really quite spectacular. So what happens as this moves up and as this hair cell shortens and lengthens? Well, remember that the outer hair cells are, are on the outer part of the cochlear duct, and their stereocilia, their hair bundle, is, is attached to the tectorial membrane. So they're attached up here. And so as they, as they shorten and lengthen, they essentially pull up on, from this membrane, which has the effect, it has a direct effect on this cell and also changes the fluid as it, as it um, flows through here. And it provides the stimulus for the inner hair cell. Now, you may think that I am overstating this, and I am not. And I will tell you how I know that. Because a person with Preston, with a Preston mutation, if they do not have Preston, they are deaf, not hard of hearing, but deaf. And what that tells you is that it, without cochlear amplification, the signal coming into the cochlea is insufficient to drive uh, inner hair cell responses. So it's not that the outer hair cells are modulating the stimulus. That would be really cool. But it's even, it's even more amazing than that. The, inner, the outer hair cells are creating the stimulus. If there's no outer hair cell function, if there's no Preston function, there is no hearing. Those individuals without Preston function are deaf. That's the cochlear amplifier. The stimulus is created in part by the receptors. Now, the, the, way, uh, the way this works is that if, you, if we go back to the board, as you recall, the bony cochlea has a cochlear duct inside of it. The highest frequencies are down here, and the lowest frequencies are up here. The highest frequencies uh, up here down at, at the base of the cochlea, this is the base of the bony cochlea, this part of the cochlear duct is very taut. And so the characteristic frequency, the resonant frequency right here is very high. Whereas the resonant frequency up here at the apex is very low. So at the apex, it's a low frequency. Uh, resonant frequency, the uh, characteristic frequency, so that when the hair cell moves at a high frequency, it does not it does not reverberate here, but it does here, and vice versa. If if the hair cell here moves at a low frequency, it does it has it catches the resonant frequency and it, it increases the movement up and down here, whereas a low frequency stimulus will not increase the uh, the excursion down here. And so in this way, not only does, uh, do the outer hair cells increase the amplitude of the signal, but they also increase the uh, resolution. So it Im improves the tonotopy, it improves the distinction. It allows you to distinguish between, say, 500 and 505 hertz because the character, characteristic frequencies at these two locations are different. Okay, great. So now we're gonna go on and look at autoacoustic emissions.